July 2nd was a huge day for coaster enthusiasts, as we saw the opening of two new B&M coasters. Orion at Kings Island opened as the world's seventh giga coaster, the tallest in the park and highlighting a rethemed section called Area 72. Once stayed over, Hershey Park opened Candymonium, a hypercoaster standing as the centerpiece to the park's new entrance area, Chocolate Town. Although the area itself was not fully completed at the time of the coaster's opening, it did not take away from the experience of riding such an anticipated new attraction. Along with the new coaster came a completely revamped front entrance, one with much more room for guests to enter, as the previous entrance was kind of a bottleneck. As soon as you get through the gates, Candymonium commands the spotlight by being front and center, the coaster's final helix being right in front of you. This makes a great first impression, and I can't wait to see what it looks like once the Kisses Fountain starts running. Chocolate Town as a whole looks great, but there was a huge lack of shade in the area and the abundance of black tot made it so the heat was pretty intense. I do expect this to be fixed in time, as the rest of the area nears completion. Approaching Candymonium Station, you'll get a great view of the coaster's airtime hills, showing the ride that's about to begin. There isn't much theming to Candymonium. It's themed to three types of Hershey's candy, and that's about it. The logos for said candy can be seen all throughout the station. The queue is entirely housed underneath the station, a decision I appreciate as it's nice to get out of the sun for a while during the wait. Once you get up the stairs, you've reached the loading platform, with a few more Hershey signs hanging from the ceiling. That's about all the theming you're getting with this coaster, aside from the trains of course. There are three trains, each color-coded to resemble Reese's Cups, Twizzlers, and Hershey's Kisses. The more astute among you have probably noticed that the trains only have seven rows and not eight like a lot of other B&M hypercoasters. You might think that will impact the airtime in the back row, but I can assure you it does not. The restraints on these trains are the usual B&M clamshell design, but there's also a seat belt which might upset some of you. I personally didn't find it to be much of an intrusion on any of the seven rides I got that day. Once the train is dispatched, you're going to ascend the 210-foot tall lift hill, 10 feet taller than Skyrush, making it the tallest coaster in the park. The first drop is one of the best parts of the ride, as I was surprised by the amount of airtime I got. Keep in mind that my first ride was in the second to back row, but I got thrown up out of my seat on that drop. Just listen to how much it caught me off guard. You don't really get any airtime from the drop in the front, so back row is the way to go here. Once you hit the first airtime hill, you get the first of many floater airtime moments. I swear I got a solid two seconds of floater in the second to back row on this hill. Then the train enters the classic B&M hammerhead turn, which didn't really have many forces on it, save for some slight laterals. It actually comes really close to inverting, but not quite. The next airtime hill, though, has an unfortunate addition, trim brakes. Candymonium unfortunately has two sections with trims that kill a lot of the airtime you might receive, and this hill is the first one. I do want to mention that out of the seven rides I got on Candymonium, I only noticed that the trims were on for two of them. Without trims, this hill provides another good pop of floater airtime, but with them, you're only out of your seat for about a second. The speed hill heading into the first helix is great though, and you get no time between elements here as the train goes right into the upward helix. Now here's my favorite part of the coaster, a banked near-miss element as the train goes right next to one of the lift hill's main supports. You're tossed out of your seat when you go through this, and I noticed that pretty much everyone on the train put their hands down here. The next airtime hill has another trim on it, but I didn't feel that this one killed the airtime as badly as the first one. Maybe because I was distracted by the first section of track that guests see when they get through the front gate, the helix around the Kisses Fountain. Now, the fountain wasn't yet completed when I was there, but being able to go over the walkway and look down at everyone watching and taking photos was an excellent touch. I can't wait to see what this part is like once they get the fountain up and running. And I could easily see a crowd of people hanging out here all day just to watch the coaster go by. One more airtime hill remains, giving another pop of floater before the train heads into the brake run, ending a ride on Candymonium. As you turn right back toward the station, the track gets pretty close to Skyrush, which I'm sure will make for some great photos and videos. Candymonium surprised me, as all the other B&M hypercoasters I've ridden before this were solid coasters with decent floater airtime, but the floater on this coaster was some of the strongest I've ever experienced, especially on the first drop and first airtime hill. Those trims on two of the hills do kill a lot of the train's momentum, but as I learned from the rides I got, they might not always be on. Without trims, Candymonium is a floater machine, and the track is smooth as glass. I didn't notice a rattle of any kind on any of my rides, and this is a coaster I could easily marathon all day. But I know what most of you are thinking. How does it compare to Skyrush? There was a good bit of confusion when Candymonium was announced, leading to questions like, why is Hershey building another hypercoaster? And why isn't this a giga coaster? Among a few others. The truth of the matter is that Skyrush is one of the most intense coasters Intamin has ever created. And with its combination of relentless speed and abrupt transitions, not to mention those thigh-crushing restraints, clearly isn't for everybody. 
Candymonium was meant to appeal more to those who do not necessarily consider themselves coaster enthusiasts, but instead are just looking for a fun, rewritable coaster that can be enjoyed over and over again, and in that regard, Candymonium succeeds. The coaster is a capacity monster, running three trains that made sure that the wait never exceeded 15 minutes during my visit. This was a safe, reliable choice for Hershey Park, and I'm sure that the public will agree. Some enthusiasts may be disappointed that the coaster isn't more intense, but if you ask me, the abundance of floater airtime and that near-miss element more than make up for it. Besides, Skyrush is still right next door if you're looking for that intensity, but having the option of both in the same park makes this a win-win situation. Hershey Park now has one of the strongest coaster lineups out there, and I can easily see riders getting off Candymonium and circling right back around the station to go on again. I'm giving Candymonium a 9 out of 10. Some might be disappointed that it isn't more intense, and those trims do take away a lot of the airtime. But it's only on two hills, and the rest of the ride is still incredibly solid. If you've ridden Candymonium, please let me know what you thought of it down in the comments. And as always, thank you for watching, and stay tuned for more coaster content coming soon here on Rampaging Rex Productions.